Hi everybody, I'm Helen Malherber from Rare Diseases South Africa and today I'm sharing a short presentation about why rare disease patients, family members, caregivers should get involved and even present at scientific conferences. So what's it all about? So a quick rundown on what I'm going to share. Firstly, I'm going to talk about why we should get involved and present at conferences as patients, as family members, as caregivers. Then I'll touch on what an abstract is, explain why we need it and how it's used. Then I'll speak through the submission and the review process, so how you actually practically go about submitting an abstract. And then I'll touch on presenting and preparing scientific posters and presentations at these conferences. The burning question, why should we present at conferences at all as rare disease patients, as family members, as caregivers? So there's surprisingly a large number of reasons why we should actually present at scientific conferences. It offers us a lot of opportunities. Firstly, we can access the latest information that we need, whether it's cutting edge treatments, information on research studies that we can get involved in, or similarly clinical trials. It helps us also to gain insight or more insight into our specific conditions to help inform those healthcare decisions that we need to make. And we can have that cutting information at our fingertips. It also provides an opportunity to connect and network with other patients, clinicians, genetic counsellors, researchers, other patient groups and so on that you may not have in your sphere of contact. And it offers such an opportunity that you can chat to these people over tea um, in a much more informal setting as well. So you have opportunities that you don't have in any other scenario. It also gives us an opportunity to share our lay expertise as patients, as caregivers. We're the ones that are facing challenges 24 seven living with a particular condition and nobody else has that expertise. So we're actually wrapping up with a bow and sharing it. And that gives an opportunity for us to highlight where we consider there to be gaps. And we can also help target research agendas and ensure that certain priorities are added to the list and that they are tackled through research. It also provides us an opportunity to advocate and raise awareness for our rights as patients, as well as our needs. And of course, it brings in true patient centricity by placing the patient at the center, by being right there in the mix with all the other stakeholders. I think one of the most important things for me is that it gives a voice to patients and caregivers. And that really validates us as individuals, as patients, as parents of those with children with rare conditions. And that is so empowering. And it gives us an opportunity not only to inspire others, but to be inspired ourselves and to receive hope and emotional support in this situation from a very unlikely place in many in many cases you'll be surprised how many clinicians you'll talk to they have a family member that's also affected by a condition and so you get a real personal connection with them as well and it's important to remember that you, these conferences have a longer term impact there are conferencing conference proceedings that are published afterwards some presentations and some conferences are actually put into an article where they report on what happened at the conference and so on and there's an opportunity, if you submit an abstract, for that to go into the conference proceedings and be published. So it has a, a much longer shelf life and impact than just the actual day that you present at the conference. They are so important for engagement. And we have to remember that they happen if we are there or not. And as we say, nothing about us without us. We need to get in there, get into the mix and make our presence felt. We're going to chat about why don't patients and caregivers present more at scientific conferences or participate as much. And this is interesting. And a big shout out to all our patient ambassadors who gave lots of reasons and feedback on our WhatsApp group earlier this week that really helped me pull this slide together with some of the key reasons. So the first one that came through was there's just not good enough inclusivity and opportunity. Patients are rarely invited. And in many cases, you'll find it's the same patient that's invited over and over again because there just aren't the connections between the researchers, um, the industry groups and the patients. So in that case, it's them coming to us. They're not coming to us. Second point is we don't know about them. So if we don't know what we don't know, we don't know. <laughs> so we have to actually go out there and take responsibility and find out about them ourselves. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about how to do that later. Another big reason that came through was financial constraints. And of course, there are a number of costs that are associated with conferences, whether it's the registration fees, which can be very steep, um, accommodation and travel if it's at a distance, 
and some patients require one-on-one -on -one caregiving and somebody to accompany them. And these are significant costs, not just for patients, but also for researchers, for clinicians, and this money has to come out of somewhere. Um, there's also health limitations. Um, some patients simply cannot go and present. Um, they could potentially do it virtually. In other cases, you know, those long scheduled appointments that we have, you know, you can't get an appointment for three months. And of course, the one day that your appointment is, is the same day that you're supposed to be speaking at the conference. And you simply cannot cancel or postpone that appointment any further. So these are real challenges that we face in trying to fit everything in. And of course, there's also implications on our time in terms of healthcare routines and daily treatments, weekly, monthly treatments, getting leave from your job, potential loss of earnings if you're having to take leave without pay, and so on. And these are realistic because conferences can take up a, a lot of your time. And obviously, when you're at a conference, you can't be doing other things if you're going to be really present in the moment at the conference. There can be some accessibility issues preventing in-person or full participation. Um, that's largely going to be in the case of um, in-person conferences where you're going to actually be there and present in person. There's transport and caregiving implications for that. And there also may be some complications with accessing and participating virtually. We also have the issue of languages in South Africa. We now, together with side language, we have 12 official languages. And of course, it's not just the actual language, it's the type of language that many people use at these conferences. It's a lot of jargon. And I'll give you a big secret or tell you a big secret. A lot of the time, it's just a fancy word for something really simple. Not always, but a lot of the time. So it's having to demystify and overcome that medical jargon. And then one thing that came through really strongly on the group was fear, insecurity, inadequacy, stigma, and the, well, first of all, the fear of public speaking, which many of us have or have had. And then there's the fear of being misunderstood or discriminated because of the condition that you're living with. And it, it takes very brave people. I mean, it takes a lot of well, you have to be brave to stand up in these places and speak. And But I cannot tell you how powerful it is when you see somebody up there sharing their heart. And a lot of the time you look around the room and you can see that you've really connected and you've really touched those people, whether they're clinicians, they're from pharmaceutical companies or whatever. It brings it home and it makes it real. And of course, the other biggie is limited information about a specific conference and you've got to know that it's worthwhile. Is it worthwhile you bothering to submit an abstract, to participate, to go there, all the financial issues um, and other capacity constraints and so on to actually get there? Um, and that can be difficult because a lot of these conferences don't give a lot of information about the conference. And you've got to be careful. There's a lot of dodgy ones out there as well where they're just in it to make money and they don't have an underlying um, goodwill and reason for doing the conference. So I've identified why we should participate, why we're potentially not, and the various challenges we face. Then I thought through, so how can we actually do it more? How can we get more involved in conferences and present? So you've got to get involved. We've got to get involved. Join up with the patient groups, not just with rare diseases, but with your specific patient or condition specific group. Share your story, share your story online, social media, and so on. Connect with researchers, connect with clinicians, offer your services and say, hey, if you ever need a patient to speak on this, I'm your person. And then you've got to stay informed. We've got to stay informed. Stay, stay signed up, subscribe to emailers um, and newsletters. If you don't have time to read them at the time, just shove them in a folder like I do. And then when you have a little bit of time, you can go through them. Follow social media, websites and so on. And so that the information will essentially come to you. And then, of course, we're seeing our healthcare providers a lot. So we can talk and collaborate with them. And I'm sure many of us have built up good relationships with them that in some senses are, are more of a personal relationship. And perhaps you can say to them, you know, if you ever need someone, I'm your person. And then this issue of financial support, which is a huge biggie, especially today with flights costing so much and so on, and the steep registration costs, which believe me are an issue for everybody. We ask, I ask for every conference I go to, regardless of whether they advertise that there is financial support, I will ask them and say, hey, I'm from a low middle income country. I'm working at a nonprofit organization. Please, can you help me in some way? Um, and so, for example, a conference I'm going to in November, they're covering my registration fee and they're covering my hotel for three nights, which makes a huge difference. 
And so you've got to ask and you've got to be innovative in terms of maybe the company who produces your medicine for your specific condition, you can go to them and say, hey, um, I would like to present at this and it's going to add value for you and me um, and the wider community. Can you please help with support for this? And in many cases, you'll see that there's also a special um, fee reduction for patients. And in some cases, and it, it's not um, a one size fits all approach, they often reduce the costs for patient participation. Or if you're an invited speaker, you actually attend for free for that day. So it very much depends from situation to situation. So you need to investigate, find out. And if you don't ask, you shall not receive. So it's always worth asking. And then you can also be selective. You can, what I'll do is I'll look at the program for a conference and I'll think, hmm, I like that, I like that. Which day is it worthwhile me attending if I can't attend the whole thing? And then you can also consider participating virtually if it's a hybrid event, if it's being held in person and virtually. And you can sign up and whatever, and then there's often much lower fee for participating virtually. And you can often have access to those recordings a lot longer after the event as well. So you can listen to them a few times um, and quite long after the conference as well. And it's important for us to advocate for in our inclusivity and getting included in these. So we also need to make sure that we're included and that the appropriate accommodations are made to enable us to fully participate, whether that's ensuring that there's a ramp to get up to the podium or there are certain facilities available and so on. And they need to take that responsibility to do that. But we have to often be the ones to reach out and say, hey, can you do this? Have you done this? And so on. I think it's also important to hone your craft. So you cannot be expected to go to 10 different conferences and give the same message. It's important, and this, this, is, this responsibility is on us. We need to make sure that our message is tailored to that specific situation, that audience, that conference, what is the theme of the conference, and tailor it and update it appropriately. I've got about, I don't know how many presentations, and I use a lot of the same building blocks in each presentation, but I'll frame it differently or I'll put it in a different context. So you have a lot of the same message, you're just, your delivery is actually a bit different. And that's really important because we need to hone our craft. And we can ask for detailed information about the conference. Who's organizing it? Is it um, a conference organizing company? Is it an NPO behind the scenes that's actually organizing it? What are the aims of the conference? What do they want to get out of it? Are there other patients involved? Who else is presenting and so on? It's always really important to look at those issues before you make a decision as if, you, if it's relevant for you to be there. And then, of course, just generally talk to other patients, other patients who have spoken at conferences and get their tips and their guidance on what works. Watch out for this. You should do this and don't do that. Um, and just really get as much information you can about it before you go ahead. And of course, practice makes perfect. The, the more you do it, the more you dip your toe in the water and you get involved, almost the easier it becomes. And some conferences are easier and better than others. But the beginning ones, yeah, it's hard. It does take a lot of bravery and a lot of guts. But boy, it's so worth it. Now I'm just going to tackle the concept of an abstract, what it is, how it's used, why we need it, how we do it, and so on. So what is an abstract? Well, if you plug it into Google, it will actually tell you that it's a brief summary of something that helps the reader to quickly understand what it's about, what its purpose is. And I think if you Google that and you'll see all these other words coming up afterwards saying it's um, a summary of a piece of research or whatever. But in essence, all it is is a standalone summary that you can read and get an overall picture of what this person is going to talk about or write about or the work that they've done or how they're involved somewhere. And it's important to remember that it needs to be standalone and that it can't be an excerpt of something. So you might write a whole paper, you might write your whole talk, you might do your whole presentation, but then the abstract pulls it all together. And so you can read that and understand completely what it's about without having to see the whole thing. And these abstracts are used usually at the start of scientific articles and for people who want to present either an oral presentation or a scientific poster at a conference, because the decision making process about who is going to be involved, who is going to be speaking on the program, they need some information in front of them to decide how they're going to do that. And that is what the abstract does. Um, a few quick tips about abstracts 
is just try to avoid acronyms and don't include references in abstract. That's always a no-no. You don't include a reference or a citation in an abstract. So what should it include? Well, you've got to have a clear aim at the beginning. What did you do and why did you do it? And it's also handy to have a sentence in there just to give a bit of background or content context and some maybe a little bit of evidence, a stat or two. And then you focus on what is the problem that you're tackling and why is it not already been addressed? Why is it still a problem? And then it's just a few quick things, how you did it, which is called your method, what you found, your results, and what does this mean? What are the implications for patients living with that condition? What are the implications for diagnosis? And how is it significant? And then you just wrap it up in a bow with your conclusions and your recommendations. Next, just a few quick tips on how to write an abstract. First of all, make sure you're guided and you, you comply with the abstract requirements for this particular conference. They give usually all those details in an email or on the website, and you need to make sure that you adhere to those, including the word count. It's usually between two and 300 words. It might vary. And every word counts because it can be tricky to fit everything into such a small number of words. Make sure you adhere also to the formatting requirements if you've got to upload your, your abstract as a Word file or other format, or if you've got to cut and paste it into a form that's online on the platform that they're using. Ensure that you proofread for errors and typos you wanted to come across as professional, and ensure that you abide by the submission process and the deadline for submission, because you, if you submit it after the date, it's likely not to be considered in that conference. Keep it simple but yet be specific and very clear. Don't try to over explain everything, avoid broad statements and claims. And you've got to try and be comprehensive and concise at the same time and make sure it's a smooth read, avoid jargon and repetition. And what I'll often do is I'll read it out loud to myself and then you can see what doesn't work, what does work, what you need to change and what you can potentially shorten because you realize you are saying something twice. It needs to be honest, unbiased and not misleading. And also it needs to be scholarly. And if you Google this word, it comes up saying having or showing knowledge, learning, serious study. And it sometimes puts the word academics in there. But it's basically taking something seriously and learning about it and using various processes and, and so on just to actually pull it together. And you've got to make sure you tailor it to the specific audience and the theme of the conference. So is it all going to be clinicians there? Is it going to be neuroscientists? Is it going to be patient groups? Is it going to be government? And adapt it accordingly. And it's important to remember that a well-written abstract helps the reader to skim your work to decide if they want to read the rest or hear the rest at the conference. So your abstract may be the deciding factor of whether that person will come and hear your talk, especially if there's a parallel session like there is at many conferences and they because they jump around between them and they may come in specifically to see yours if they like what they see in the abstract. And it's got to be enough information in the abstract for people to cite it without listening or reading, reading it at all. Often lots of scientific papers. The only thing that you get to read or I'll get to read is the abstract, but it has all the key information in there. So you can cite it um, in another paper without actually having to read the whole paper or listen to the whole presentation. And it's important to remember as well, really important, that a lot of these scientific papers especially are only available if you pay for them. Um, and so sometimes the title and the abstract is the only part that you can get for free. And that's why it's so important because that might be the only part that's being read. I wanted to share an example of an abstract. This is one that I wrote for a specific conference and it was accepted and I did present at that conference. A um, bit of a boring one, I'm sorry, but it actually gives you an idea of the kind of length, the information that you need to include, and the format. And if you have access to the internet, YouTube, there are heaps of resources out there for, for you to find. You can listen to videos. I particularly like YouTube, and there's a couple of, well, this guy, Andy Stapleton, I really like his YouTube. He really demystifies, he's honest, he's enthusiastic, and he he doesn't talk in a, you know, a, a way you can't understand. I really like him and you really get the message. And I've listed a few other websites there for how you go about writing an effective conference abstract. I'm now going to run through very briefly the submission process and the review process. How is the process undertaken? What are the steps? So the first step is 
an announcement or a call for abstracts is made by the conference organizers. This might be done on their website via social media, newsletters, emailers, etc. So that's why it's important. You need to sign up um, to newsletters and make sure you're connected so that the information can come to you. This is normally quite um, a long time ahead of the conference. For example, our RedX conference is taking place in February next year. Our call opened 1st of July this year and our closing date is in October for the abstracts to be submitted. So there's plenty of time for you to pull your ideas together, talk to a few people, start writing something, finish it, and then submit it. So there's usually maybe a couple of months for you to prepare the abstract. It's very important that you check the submission deadline. When is the closing date um, and the time zone when you can submit um, your abstract up until? And often you'll see that that deadline as well is quite far ahead of the conference. In our case, our deadline is in October and our conference is in February. And the time thereafter is used by the organizers to actually review all the abstracts that have been submitted and to finalize the program. And we anticipate, for example, the X program being finalized by end of the year so that when we get into 2024, we're ready to go. And it's just the last arrangements for the conference. The next step is, of course, submitting your abstract. In the olden days, this would be you would have an email address and you would email it as an attachment, as a Word file or PDF or whatever. That's largely been replaced today by online submission platforms that are set up by the organizers of the conferences. Generally speaking, you'll have to create an account, you know, use your email, create a password, make sure you don't forget the password. <laughs> Um, and then once you've logged in, you can add in the author information, often multiple author information. You can add in everybody and their affiliations. So that would be, for example, the patient group that you're affiliated to, whether that's rare diseases, South Africa or an individual other group or a university. And then you upload or paste your abstract, depending on the format. For example, Rare X, you're just going to be pasting your abstract into the online form and then you click on submit and it's done. And you can actually edit the abstract prior to submission deadline, assuming you don't submit it the night before or the right before the deadline, in which case it is as it is. If you submit early, you can actually edit your abstract right up until that deadline. Then the review process kicks in and a group of people, a panel of experts, usually a range of stakeholders and experts are brought together and they're usually handpicked by the organizers because of their expertise and their specific perspective so that there's a range of people involved and they undertake the peer review. And this is maybe done double blind or single blind. Now, what that means is in cases of double blind, you won't know who the reviewers are who are reviewing abstract and they won't know who you are, the one submitting the abstract. So nobody knows who anybody is. In the case of single blind, what happens there is that in what you, you may know who the reviewers are on the review panel. In our case on Rare X, they're um, listed on the website, but they won't know who those are that are submitting. Um, in some cases, it's completely open in that there is no blinding and everybody knows who everybody is. So that's a little bit of demystification right there. Um, the abstracts are then allocated for review. If there's a large number of abstracts, they might have to divide them up and um, different teams within the larger group of reviewers actually look at them. If there's a lower number, all the reviewers might review them. Um, and then they use a specific ru rubric or scoring card to actually score the abstracts and decide, you know, should this be included on the program? Is it relevant to our theme? Um, what problem is it tackling? Um, the discussion and the significance and the quality of the abstract. And then a decision is taken. Is this going to be accepted or rejected to go on the program? And even if it's applied to be a poster or an oral, it can always be switched around. So for example, you might apply to do an oral presentation, but the review panel might say, actually, I think this would be a better place to be as a, a poster, a scientific poster. And there is nothing wrong with that at all. Um, you still get to present at the conference. It's just a different format. Here's a practical example. I'm sharing here the Rare X 2024 call for abstracts. So it's quite detailed in that they must be submitted in English. The title should define the topic and have no abbreviations. The body of the abstract does allow standard abbreviations and acronyms, but they should be defined on the first use. You have a maximum word count of 30 words for your title. And for the body of the abstract, the maximum is 300 words. You can't use graphics, photos or tables in the abstract. And 
while you can have a lot of different, uh, uh, well, a number of authors um, that are allowed to be on the abstract, you can only choose one to present per submission. And you also have an opportunity to submit the, a brief biography, a few words about the person, who they are, where they're based, what they're doing, um, and that's limited to 100 words. And then it's your responsibility or the person that's submitting the abstract, it's your job to make sure that it's accurate, professionally presented, and if there's errors, typos, grammar, whatever, anything wrong, it's going to be reproduced as it is. There's no further opportunity to actually edit that. Then you actually have to choose a theme under which you will submit an abstract. So lots of conferences have these and you can actually see, for example, here, community engagement would be a great one for a lot of patients to actually submit under. But you could also um, think about innovation or diagnosis, share your diagnostic journey, what helped, what didn't help, what was the, how long did it take, um, what was the process, and your experience of coordinated care. So don't think you've always got to be limited to the community engagement, although a lot of conferences often shove us in there um, as patients. So you can actually see and tailor your abstract to where you best fit. It might mean that the reviewers actually put you somewhere else um, and don't think it's under the right theme, but start as you mean to go on. And then, of course, you can decide if you want to select um, oral presentation or a poster, um, your preferred, preferred presentation type. So if you feel that it's more suited to being presented as a poster, just choose a poster from the outset. It may well be, as I said before, you choose an oral presentation, but you get allocated as a poster. No harm in that at all. Um, and you're still getting on the agenda. So, and then final information that we've included in the RareX call is that all abstracts will be evaluated by the program committee who will accept, reject, or ask for modifications or additional information. They have the right to do that. And you've got to make sure, again, check your submission, make sure it's perfect because it's going to be published as is. And then discretion is, the program committee has the discretion to decide if it's gonna be a poster or a presentation. Finally, with regards to the call, some key dates that we list, and most conferences list these key dates. Um, generally, the opening abstract date, 1st of July, and the submission for abstracts is the 18th of October for RareX. And that's also the same date for any amendments or changes or edits to those abstracts is the same closing date. The review is going to be undertaken from the 18th of October to the 10th of November. That's meaning that the, the scientific program committee gets together they look at all of the abstracts and they score them. And then there's usually a meeting or two and it's decided this one, this one, this one, this one, based on that scoring. And then all the authors, those that have submitted abstracts are notified of whether it's accepted or rejected by the 13th of November. And then there's a, a, a short time when those, just because you've had an abstract accepted, it doesn't mean that you've actually can go to the conference yet or you need to find funding. So you need to register for um, the conference by the 4th of December. So there's a little bit of leeway there um, to kind of still try and find those funds if you need to for travel, for accommodation, and to actually decide, okay, can I actually realistically go to this conference or not? Then I've tried to give a practical step-by-step -step guide here. So how do you submit a rare X abstract? If you go to the URL here, but probably an easier way, just go to the Rare Disease South Africa website and a pop-up will come up. As you go there, stay on the home page in a few seconds, mm -hmm. a pop-up comes and you can just click on the link and it takes you right through to the Rare X website itself. And you'll see on the website at the top, you can click on abstracts and then you just scroll down. It just gives all the information again about you know how to submit an abstract there. Scroll down to the bottom and click on here where it says click here to submit your abstract. And then you click on create a new account if you haven't yet had an account there and you create your login. So that's where you put your email, your password so you can log in and out. And then on the abstract portal, which you're then in, you click on contact information and you just complete your information as the author and other author information. And then you can get to the grips with the real stuff. Click on abstract submission and you literally just follow the prompts. And I've got a few screens now just to share with you to show what it looks like. How do you do it? And of course, there's another um, toggle at the top where you can click on edit abstracts and that's where you can actually edit before the closing date. So here's a screen grab from the portal, the submission portal for RareX 2024. 
And you can see I've clicked on abstract submission at the top. And this is literally the first page that will come up once you've clicked on that toggle. And this is where you put your title in. And you can see clearly there that the word limit for the title is 30 words. And it will literally count your words as you put those into the screen. So the next screen is actually concerning the themes. And this actually quite nicely shows the whole screen this time. So there's a drop down menu where you can choose the theme of where you want your abstract to be slotted into. And you can see there you can save it as a draft or you can continue. So you can actually work on this for a day or two, save it as a draft without finishing, go back to it the next day or two, re-log in um, to the platform and you'll be able to finish it. The next screen is author affiliation. And this is where you put your details in if you're the author. Um, so that's your affiliation. So, for example, I put rare diseases, South Africa, the city, the country. Um, and then there's the same option down below in terms of you can either save it as a draft and come back to it later or you can just continue. The real guts of submitting the abstract is this section where you upload your abstract. So this is where you actually cut and paste or copy and paste and you drop it into this file. So it's always best to prepare your abstract in Word because you can then you can check the word count that it's compliant. And then you've got um, it recorded in a safe place so you can copy and paste it into your form. Provision is made on the platform as well in the cases where you've got a number of authors. And so you can add in the different authors. There's different boxes where you can at the bottom, you can see it says add author. And then there's a little box that you check. So is this the author that's going to be the presenter? And you just check that box. And that box can only be checked for one author. So, for example, let's say I'm actually submitting an abstract. I'm the only person on there on the abstract as an author. So I'm the presenter. And then also for the main presenter, you need to drop in and paste a short biography of that person. And this is usually used in the handbook, in the program um, and so on. So it gives a bit of information about the presenter. And again, there's a word limit here. It's 150 words and it counts as you write. Finally, once you've submitted your abstract, you can actually click on the edit abstracts menu bar at the top and it will actually list the abstracts that you've submitted. So under title, it will list the title of the abstract, the status um, and so on. And then it has an option for you to edit or delete. So you can actually edit it right up to the submission date or you can actually delete. If you submitted more than one abstract, you can actually delete one. So it's not actually put into the mix and taken forward. So to wrap up, I'm going to share a few examples and share some tips on scientific posters and presentations for these type of conferences. So what is a scientific poster? Basically, it's your abstract, but in a poster format. And that is essentially what it is. You do not need to put your abstract into the poster as an abstract. You generally divide it up into the little chunks of the introduction, the aim, the results, the method and the discussion and the conclusion. So you're using your abstract and you're basically just putting it in a different format using pictures and so on. It's important that you comply again with the formatting specifications. They will generally give once you've been accepted for a science scientific poster at a conference, they will send you the details on what are the size constraints. Um, it doesn't need to be portrait or landscape, etc. And this is for obviously hard copy in person scientific posters. Sometimes now they're doing virtual posters. So you might have to prepare your poster in a PowerPoint format um, as a presentation, even though it's a poster. So things do differ. But generally speaking, if it's hard copy, you'll need the specs and then you can set those specs in PowerPoint when you're preparing your poster. Very important to include on the poster the title, the authors, their affiliations, logos, um, and then you break it up again into the intro, the method, the results, the discussion. Don't forget to leave some space at the bottom for a few key references and acknowledgements that might be to say thank you to rare diseases South Africa for blah, blah, blah. Or it might be to a specific person. Often you have to put in a note there about who funded you. Let's say somebody funded you to actually go to the conference. You say thank you to so and so for funding support for travel, for example. Important to remember that a scientific poster is different from those posters that we used to do at high school. Um, there's no glue. There's no scissors. It's all done electronically and generally you do it in PowerPoint, um, probably the easiest way. And then you have it printed and laminated. And generally these are a size 
um, A0 or A2, they vary. So they're quite big. Um, and it is worth having it printed properly and laminated because the last thing you want to do is when you're traveling there or you're putting the poster up and it rips. If it's laminated, it can't do that. And also, yes, it has cost implications, but it has a much longer shelf life because what happens to a lot of these posters is they get put up um, in offices, uh, university corridors or whatever, and you'll often walk down and you'll say, oh, there's my poster from that conference. And the same applies. You can have these put up. You could even frame it if you want, um, and you can actually make sure it's on view because you get to take it home again afterwards. Main tip I have is just keep it simple. Don't use too much text. Use pictures, use processes. Um, there's lots of little tools and gadgets and so on on PowerPoint and just make it as engaging as possible. There's lots of templates out there you can use, um, lots of resources and make sure you use appropriate color combinations. Make sure it's legible, that, that the font size is large enough. And remember that space itself is a design element. Just because there's a space, you don't have to fill it. One thing I found with posters is consider using colored borders to help it stand out, because generally speaking, not always. You're putting it up on a solid color background on a board, and that's normally white or black. Um, and I find that having some kind of a, um, a border actually helps it to stand out, and it stands out from other posters. You may not know, but a lot of the time on the program that is said for posters, you may be allocated to be there to present your poster. So you literally stand next to your poster and people come around viewing the posters and then They'll read yours, yours, and then they'll ask you questions or you can say you can be engaging and say, hi, um, let me talk you through my poster. And so you'll actually have a time slot on the program to present your poster. Um, and they're usually in the area where people are milling around, having tea and coffee and chats. So there's a lot of repeat visitors as well. So it's a, an excellent opportunity. As I said previously, some might be done virtually as PowerPoints, others as hard copy. And one question, and it's worth something really bearing in mind, what happens if you have your poster accepted, but you can't get to the conference? It might be a last minute thing, or you might not be able to get there at all. But so-and-so is going who you know. They can actually take your poster, put it up for you, um, and present it for you, or you just don't present. Um, so just because you can't get there, you can still submit a scientific poster. Um, you just got to check. Sometimes they might make it a requirement of you registering but not always. So there's lots of opportunities that are very low cost. And there's usually a time specified ahead of the conference to put your poster up, and then there's a time to take it down. So you just gotta make sure you're in the know and find out when that time is. And it's always worthwhile taking backup press stick or whatever, because a lot of the time, not enough um, attention is, is placed upon what they use and how they adhere these posters to the panels and a lot of them fall down. So make sure you've got a backup plan, take whatever you need to make sure that doesn't happen. So now I'm going to share just three examples of posters that we have done and that we have presented at conferences. This was one that was done last year, I think, for a conference um, by Rare Diseases. And you can see we just literally divided it up into blocks, the aim, who is involved, why a patient registry, um, how was it developed, and then future plans, and so on. So very simple and quite white, um, this one. There's a lot of white space. This is another example of a scientific poster. You can see very different approach, very different style. Um, at the top, um, there's a nice quote that's been pulled out, which is quite eye-catching. Because remember, you got to try and make it so that you want pe that people want to read your post, that they want to stop at yours and read it. So eye-catching, use of color, great here, and the little blocks of information again, um, make it quite easy to read. You can see all the logos at the bottom. You can see the title in there and all the authors and their affiliations. This finally is probably my favorite poster, another one that we did earlier this year that was presented at the genetics conference in Cape Town. And you can see here the border around the outside makes it stand out against a white background and the use of imagery and pictures um, was very clever that the way that Marianne did this. And I think this was this is a very nice example and it's a simplistic example. It shows you that you don't have to have 
lots of complex information and tables and graphs and so on, but you can still present it in an interesting way that's impactful. Here's just a few pointers and tips about scientific presentations. There are loads of resources out there online, YouTube, um, that give you so many good ideas about how to prepare a presentation, um, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. So I encourage you to go out there and find it. My tips that I came up with and some things that I learned along the way. First of all, say what you're going to say, say it and then say what you said. The first time they might not be listening and they might hear it the second time, they might hear it the third time. So repetition is OK in the sense that you need to plan it out and be clear on what you're saying. Secondly, as a rule of thumb, generally allocate one minute per slide. So say, for example, your talk is you have a 10 minute slot. Um, I would say 10 slides max. Um, and remember that you'll spend more time on some slides, less time on title slides, for example. So it kind of averages out. But generally speaking, one minute per slide. Don't use too much text. Don't use my example that I've used today for this presentation. I've used far much, far too much text, not enough imagery, um, and it's been too much talking. But remember, people can't read and listen at the same time. So if they're trying to read your slide, um, they're not listening to you. So rather have prompt words. A list of words that prompts you to actually say what they mean. You could use themes, templates, there's so much out there that you can use. Be, be wary of distracting colors and those animated transitions between slides, very distracting. Make sure that your text is legible. For example, yellow, you might have your text in yellow and it might look great on your screen, but when it's in a huge room on a massive screen, you can't actually see that text. The definition for that yellow text is just not very good. Um, and so you can actually lose your message there. So make sure it works and avoid certain colors. Font size is important as well. And as humans, we actually read a word by the pattern of the top of the word. So be aware that if you use a capital, um, a word in full capitals or your text is in all capitals, it's much harder to read. So it takes people longer. Rather use um, lower text, sorry, lowercase text, um, much easier to read. Ultimately, keep it simple. Speak from your heart um, and they will hear you. And especially when you first start out, prepare. Know your material inside out. Know your content. I used to practice and time myself and then I do it two or three times so that I could say the different slides and the different points in different ways. And eventually you'll be able to do your talk without even referring to the slides and you'll actually be able to wing it. Make sure you include some references at the end. Google Scholar has got a lot of information on how to do that and acknowledgements. Make sure you've got a list at the end of all those people that helped you in your presentation. Um, if they gave you some data, if they just checked over it, just list their name, where they, who they are, where they're from um, as a, an acknowledgement of their input into the presentation. And then finally, don't be scared to embrace all the AI tools that are out there. There are so many, so many of them are free and just embrace it and, and make use of it. So one that I quite like for presentations is Tome. It's free. You can actually just get onto the website. You actually put in your question, for example, how do I prepare a presentation on umbrellas? And it will come up with five or six slides about umbrellas and use that as a starting point. It's usually a lot of text, but it gives you the main information that you the main points that you might want to consider including in your presentation. ChatGPT, also free, a great tool and surprisingly accurate. I mean, you, I've been putting in quite a lot of scientific questions and playing around with it, and it's actually accurate. So you can type in um, what are the main important points about umbrellas, for example, and it will come up with key points and you can regenerate it so that it does it again and again. The one thing I would say be careful about with Red, with um, AI is never use it as it is. It's a tool. It's a starting point. Um, but don't copy and paste and use as is. Add your value to it, adapt it, just use it as an idea and develop it. But so many resources out there, I encourage you to embrace them. I wanted to share here an example of a presentation. So you can see I've got six different um, slides in one on one screen, just so you can see. So I, we have a particular template and style at Rare Diseases. We have a color scheme that we use. So this shows you how you go through my slides. That one at the bottom is a little bit text heavy. Sometimes I need to do that. Um, it's quite a heavy tom um, a content. This is six more slides from the same presentation. You can actually see 
that is quite colourful. We've got real patients featured on there and different colour schemes, and it uh, makes it a lot more engaging. And then we also have an ending slide. We have a thank you that actually lists our different social media platforms that we're on. And that second to last slide references and acknowledgements. Just if I've used sources for data and um, saying thank you to people that assist. So I really hope that this has been a useful and not too long <laughs> presentation. There actually seemed to be quite a lot to say at the end of the day. So um, use, use what you like from it. Um, and I really encourage you to investigate and consider submitting an abstract to our Rare X Rare Disease Conference taking place in February next year. If you go to our website, the, the pop-up will come and you can go straight through to the Rare X and find out more there. Finally, I just want to say thank you to everybody that has um, given feedback on the WhatsApp group, the patient ambassadors, and really made this presentation happen. I hope it's been useful. If there's anything that I didn't answer or the unclear on, please don't hesitate to reach out with me on WhatsApp or to email me at research at rarediseases.co.za. I just want to encourage you, dip your toe in the water, give it a try, um, and yeah, and see how you find it. I'd love to hear your feedback, your experiences, and what you thought of this presentation, and also if there's anything else you'd like to know about that we can actually do another presentation on. Cheers, everybody.